School is in. But are you really ready to learn? Open your eyes to a new day in education with The Awakening Educator, a program specifically designed to explore a new mindful way of educating our youth. Learn about social-emotional learning, new modalities of teaching, and the most relevant topics in education with your hosts, Susan Andrian and Megan Sweet. Susan and Megan will take you inside the issues by looking at them from different points of view, from policies and research to teaching models that are actually used in schools. There's never a dull moment in this classroom. You can catch The Awakening Educator every other Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern on Spreaker, Facebook Live, WDJY 99.1 FM, WTTA 101.2, Talk 10 FM, and many other platforms. You can also watch it on our app anytime from anywhere in the world at uimediaapp.com. Have any questions you'd like to ask? Maybe you have knowledge you'd like to share. Call 678-495-4345 and share your thoughts live on air. Grab a pen and paper and get ready to open your textbooks and minds to a new way of learning on The Awakening Educator. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the UI Media Network. Hello, friends at 99.1 FM, WDJY. Hello, friends from WTTA 101.2 in Kentucky and Ohio. And welcome, Metro Atlanteans on Talk 10 FM. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so show number two, we are super excited for our first guest. Uh, Dr. Larry Cuban is a former high school so, uh, social studies teacher. He was a teacher for 14 years. He was a district superintendent for seven years and a university professor for 20 years. He's published op-ed pieces, scholarly articles, and books on classroom teaching, history of school reform, how policy gets translated into practice, and teachers and students' use of technology in K-12 and college. Recent research projects have been a study of school reform in Austin, Texas, 1954 to 2009, a large comprehensive high school in, Ma in Ma Mempleton, Mapleton, sorry, uh, being converted into several small ones between 2001 and 2009, and how structural change in U.S. schools over the past century have had little effect on altering how teachers teach. Larry's the author of over 25 books, including his most recent book, Inside the Black Box of Classroom Practice, Change Without Reform in American Education, and from 2013, and Teaching History Then and Now, A Story of Stability and Change in Schools, published in 2016. Welcome, Larry, to our show, The Awakening Educator. We're really thrilled to have you here. <clears throat> Thank you, Megan. I'm, I'm glad that I can be here. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot for us to talk with you about, and you're our first guest in our four-part series on uh, history. So we're taking history from policy to practice. So we're learning about why history is important <laughs> for us to learn about in schools, and then we're going to be next week speaking with somebody who uses history to teach race and cultural competence uh, to adults primarily and, and educators. <laughs> and then we'll be talking to a history teacher who does an in-depth history project on our third week. And then in our fourth week, we'll be talking with students of that teacher and parents of that teacher, parents of students of that teacher, um, to talk about what their experience is of that lesson. So that's our first four-parter, and you're our beginning person, which is such a, a great treat. So thank you. Yes. Thank welcome you. to the Awakening Educator. So you have a you have a long career um, and lots of different experiences that are actually kind of unique these days um, in terms of educators. And so I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the trajectory of your career and how it informs the work that you're doing now. Well, uh, Susan started it. Uh, I began teaching in 1955. Uh, okay. I was teaching in a place called McKeesport, Pennsylvania. I grew up in Pittsburgh. And I was teaching biology because I couldn't get a history job at all. So then I eventually moved to Cleveland. I was 20 years old and I moved to Cleveland and uh, got a job as a history teacher at a school called Glenville High School in Cleveland. And I worked there for seven years and it was a, uh, uh, a really uh, 
a, a world changing uh, experience for me because I was one of the few um, uh, white teachers there at the school and I hadn't known that it was an all minority school. I just hadn't known and no one ever told me. The fact that they hired me the day before Labor Day probably tells you that I was at the bottom of the barrel. In terms of <laughs> I taught there seven years and I created a lot of materials around uh, ethnicity and race and it became my first book. And from then I went on to Washington DC and trained returning Peace Corps volunteers how to teach history uh, in, a, uh, in a, a DC school called Cardoza High School, which I returned to in the book uh, about teaching history now and then. After that, uh, I, became, I went back and got my PhD at Stanford and then became a superintendent in Arlington, Virginia, right across the river from Washington, DC. And uh, I was there for seven years and that was a uh, intellectual uh, stretch for me because I learned about politics and education that mm -hmm. I had never really learned before. But it was an important set of lessons for me. And then uh, Stanford invited me back and uh, I, uh, in 2001 and then I read uh, excuse me, 1981, mm -hmm. and then I retired in 2001, and since then I've been mostly uh, writing, uh, uh, seeing friends, and bicycling. <laughs> <laughs> bicycling, that sounds fun. <laughs> uh, your approach to much of your writing comes from this historical lens. Why is that important for you? Well, as I would tell 15-year-olds uh, and 25-year-olds and 65-year-olds, if you want to understand the present, you really got to know about what happens in the past. It's not a matter of history repeating itself because history doesn't always repeat itself because the context is always different mm -hmm. from the past to the present. But there are, uh, there are, repeatable kinds of dynamics that do occur. The best example for me would be uh, race. Uh, if, you, if you really want to understand Ferguson, Missouri, or understand uh, Black Lives Matter, you've got to know the history of race in this country because it begins with the U.S. Constitution mm -hmm. uh, with the three-fifths clause where uh, slaves were counted as three-fifths of a person. And uh, uh, everyone agreed to that, to have that in the Constitution. And then you have the abolitionist movement, the Civil War, Reconstruction, all of that, and then Jim Crow laws following that. All of that, if you want, you have to understand that and know that in order to get a sense of the uh, virus of racism in American society all of these years. So I approach every single policy problem, every single problem I see around me by saying, well, where did this come from? How did it begin? How did it unfold? Mm. That's a long answer to your question, Susan. It's a, it's a great answer. And it's one that, that, you know, inspired us to have this four-part series, actually, which is understanding why, um, maybe at least for me, I can say I've been quite confounded with what we're dealing with today in America. And it's been interesting to see um, how history is coming back into being popular and important uh, to, to people now that we're seeing that it's repeating itself. And so I've been getting some comfort in some ways of seeing people making some historical references Mm -hmm. that um, are showing that some of the things that we're experiencing now have happened in the past and there's an opportunity for us to learn so that we don't repeat um, some of the issues in the past in our, in our present moment. So I think that historical grounding is, is really important. Um, you talk about in, in one of your books, uh, the, the, the Teaching Then and Now book, um, about this paradox of teaching history to either conserve the past or to change the present. You started talking about that, about that a little bit in your answer to Susan, but I'm wondering if you can give us a little bit more about that paradox that seems to often show up around social studies and history lessons. Well, the paradox is basically uh, buried in the nature of 
tax-supported public schooling. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is what I mean. Public schools have historically had two purposes. One is to conserve the values of the community, of the state, of the nation, uh, patriotism, uh, respect for authority, a whole bunch of things. Schools are expected to do that. They're expected to socialize kids. Uh, and you see that most obviously in kindergarten, how kids are supposed to behave. So that conservation is a purpose of school, but also a purpose of school is to change people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and by changing people, the hope is that you'll change society. So those contradictory purposes, preserving and reforming are built into the very purpose of schools. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's one of the reasons that I study the history of uh, public schools, because I have come to understand that, that these are two very important things that parents want, that taxpayers want, and voters want. They want kids to be socialized. That's a preserving. But they also want schools through individual uh, individuals changing to maybe alter and make better society. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm curious um, how you think that this might be related to uh, civics classes and when civics classes were removed from are uh, from education or as a required course, and if that's related to some of the things that you're talking about? Uh, well, civics was introduced in the 1920s purposely for that. Uh, civics in the junior high school it was then ninth grade, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, government courses in the senior year. In the 1920s and 30s, they called those government courses the problems of democracy. So they were both introduced uh, because one of the purposes of schooling is to um, uh, engage, uh, is to prepare adults, prepare students to be engaged in their communities. So civics and, uh, and government courses fit that. Now, with the uh, beginning in the 19... 80s and since then, <clears throat> there has been a lot of effort to uh, uh, focus on standards, on uh, curriculum standards, on testing and accountability, and the narrowing of the <laughs> curriculum to math and English. <clears throat> and so social studies and science, uh, in fact, and uh, the arts and foreign language have all been put on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been almost 30 years of that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the, the disappearance of civics, the disappearance of Latin, the disappearance of cursive writing mm -hmm. has been some of the casualties of this fierce determination to focus on certain kinds of a curriculum and, uh, and having uh, that curriculum, uh, uh, having that curriculum tested to see if, uh, if it, uh, the people responsible for teaching it uh, have done their jobs. Yeah, that's helpful. I mean, and part of what came up for me was around standards and why standards instruction may or may not be um, like the impact of standards and things like no child left behind or the other ways that we try and measure and monitor schools comes up for me as a topic that has really influenced the ways that we work with schools. And when we get back from break, our first break, um, it would be great to talk with you a little bit more about um, how you're seeing, in addition to these ways of measuring kids, what are some of the impacts you might imagine have come up for us as we, we continue to push towards measuring quality in that way? So, yeah, I'm also really curious about how, how we're uh, deciding what the standards are and who gets to have voice in that piece. Yeah. So when we come back from break, we'll talk about that. So thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Larry. Larry. Okay.
Good day, planet Earth. Michael Don Miguel Litton here in Roswell, GA. Join me every other Friday at 6 p.m. for the Ride the Vibe Show, the show where creative folks have the opportunity to share the genesis and power of their creativity, where they can intend having their talent being expressed all over the planet. Find my show on WDJY 99.1 FM on the United Intentions Spreaker Channel, iTunes, Stitcher, and many more. You can also find my show on social media on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram as United Intentions and on Twitter at Higher Intention. Jump on the wave and ride the vibe. It's a cool way for getting the creative juices flowing. Cheers to a groovy day. And remember to always ride the vibe. Welcome back to the Awakening Educator. This is Megan Sweet and Susan Andrian. And uh, we're with our guest today, Larry Cuban. Uh, you can watch us now and listen to all of our shows live on our new smart, lo- smart app, which you can download at u- uimediaapp.com. Yeah, and if you have any questions or would like to say hello, please give us a call at 678-495-4345. Yeah, you could ask a question live on the air with us, so that would be really cool. Yeah. Uh, So, Larry, welcome back. And um, as we were going into break, we were going to ask you about, you started talking about how the history of, of history, of teaching history and civics and other courses in the United States and how those have shifted and changed as our priorities have changed. And I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about standards. We've had two different kind of uh, implementations of standards now. And actually, when I started teaching, we didn't really have standards yet, I don't think. And mm-hmm. we had, we've had we now gone through two waves of them and new ways of then measuring um, student achievement. And I'm just wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about that and how you think that's shaping our, our education. Well, there have always been uh, standards uh, in schools. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, remember that the public schools in the U.S. are decentralized. There are 13,000 school districts. California has 1,000 school districts. So uh, it's always been decentralized. So every district has some standards quite often mirrored by the state standards. The, uh, the crunch for national standards began right before in the 1990s. And that came from the Nation at Risk report, which condemned public schools in America as failures. Uh, uh, The the phrase they used was that it was a rising tide of mediocrity in American schools. So the idea of having national standards grew throughout the 80s, and 90s, uh, and obviously they're around us today with the Common Core. So there's always been a movement for standards, primarily generated by the business community uh, with the Nation at Risk report, because they wanted to make schools more businesslike. They wanted to make schools more accountable. They wanted to make schools more competitive because they that was how businesses have become successful in the US and they wanted schools to help build uh, the economy. So all of that begins around the mid 1980s. And uh, as a consequence of that, the standards keep getting repeated at the state level and at the national level. Now Congress forbids the um, the federal government from establishing national uh, curriculum. So what has happened is that you get a standardization of curriculum across the country. If you're gonna study algebra in Omaha, Nebraska, and you move to Oakland, you're still gonna have algebra. Mm -hmm. And the textbooks are not gonna be that different. So there's been a, 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 a standardization that has occurred in America uh, since the mid 1980s. And all of it is geared to trying to uh, uh, reproduce national curriculum standards. And we've come quite close to that with the Common Core. Mm -hmm. The Common Core was introduced in 2010. 
And I don't know how many states, maybe half or more than half of the states already have said that all districts have in their states have to use common core standards. So this has been a part of a way of standardizing the public school experience. And then when uh, with uh, No Child Left Behind that lasted from 2001 to 2015, then you have further standardization through testing and that uh, you had to prepare students for these tests. And then the accountability mechanisms, which made uh, schools uh, labeled as failures under No Child Left Behind. And no community wants to have their schools stigmatized that way. Mm -hmm. So there was this narrowing of curriculum, the narrowing of instruction, all to uh, make schools pretty much one size fits all. Mm. And that's what and that's the what we've been in. And that's the way that I've interpreted the history of mm. schooling over the past half century. Mm. Mm. Thanks for that, Larry. Yeah. So with with the standardization and and using and that happening, what do you think are the is the impact of that on the classroom, either positive or challenges in terms of teaching? when we well, have such a narrow. The positive side would be what No Child Left Behind was to focus on ethnicity and race. That was, that was very positive because that was never done on the national level. It was done in Texas and California and Florida, but uh, uh, George W. Bush nationalized the Texas thing and said that uh, you got to be concerned that about this achievement gap between whites and minorities. That had never been publicly discussed at the national level. That was a real plus. The biggest minuses have been that the achievement gap that was recognized at that time is still there. Mm -hmm. uh, the abyss that exists between minorities and whites insofar as academic achievement is still around. That hasn't closed. It may have been reduced in some places, but it really hasn't closed yet. The second is that it narrowed the curriculum, what I said, and that uh, the state test became the, uh, the be all and end all for teachers. If your kids scored poorly on that test, uh, you ran a risk within that school and within the district that you would be uh, reprimanded, admonished. And, and then uh, it was not too long after that, that the idea of using student test scores to evaluate teachers came in because test scores were used to evaluate principals, test scores were used to evaluate districts. So this goes on and on. Those are negatives from my point of view. Yeah. Well, that's a, a great segue into something I wanted to, you to talk a little bit more about, which is that dynamic nature between stability and change that mm -hmm. face so many teachers, right? So they're constantly in a, a place of having reforms and other things kind of brought onto them yes. <laughs> um, and needing to deal with that change, but also trying to navigate their own truth within that and create you know, some kind of consistency across what they're teaching. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your theories about stability and change and how teachers fit in with all of these policies that roll out. Yeah, uh, Megan, I'll refer back to what I said, the initial purposes of schools, of tax-supported public schools in, in America, is that it, it conserves and it changes. And so stability and change are built into the very purposes of public schooling. And that happens uh, when you look from the policy to the practice in schools. Teachers have to set up routines for kids. I don't care whether it's kindergarten or AP calculus. You have to set up as a teacher these routines at stability. Yet at the same time, you don't wanna be a prisoner of that stability because there are new software out. You may have Chromebooks in your classroom that has the kind of software for a lesson that you had never done before and, and not considered. So there's constant change that goes on among teachers. And so when people, critics say that teachers never change, 
that's a uh, that's an outright lie. Mm. Teachers are always changing. Though they may not change the way reformers want them to change, and they may not change as fast as reformers want. But that's immaterial. That's irrelevant to the teacher because the teacher's responsibility are the twenty to thirty-five kids that uh, that she has in front of her. So stability and change are built into the school system as its purposes, and it's built into the nature of the age-graded school and then into the classroom. Yeah, thanks for that. So when thinking about all the different demands that teachers are are experiencing and changes within the classroom, I really like what you said about routines and ritual. That's a lot of where I focus when I'm in the classroom because we're talking about that also being a trauma-informed practice. But I'm curious, what you think about how teachers should or how how teaching history is balanced with all the other demands of teaching English and teaching math and social studies and, and where it fits in in this um, to make a complete educational experience for our students. Sure. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, uh, history uh, informs the present. So if you want to know about Uh, As I pointed out, I use the example of uh, the importance of knowing about slavery and uh, and the ex-slaves and the Jim Crow laws in the South uh, and the migration from the South to the North and what has happened uh, in uh, over the last three centuries. If you want to under if you understand that, if you know that you will understand the racial situation now and how racism is not just an individual characteristic, it's an institutional kind of characteristic because uh, the virus has been laid down for centuries, okay? So uh, that's why history is extremely important. But history teachers have to understand that, that it's not one fact after another. They have to understand that there are concepts that democracy as it was defined in when Thomas Jefferson was president uh, in, uh, in, in 1800 was not the democracy we know now. In 1800, only white males who had owned property could vote. That's not true today. Mm-hmm. So you have to understand, well, how did the franchise, how did the right to vote expand over the last uh, uh, 200 years. And uh, if you don't know that history, then you really can't understand the present why people get upset over the Supreme Court, a recent Supreme Court decision that invalidated part of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Why are people so upset about that? You gotta know that history of how hard it was for the expansion of the franchise to all Americans over a long period of time. Yeah, that's, that's, that's helpful, Larry. I was, the, we actually interviewed, we pre-recorded our interview, our part two person, and um, his name is Dante King. And it was something that I noticed and he does a, this PD on using history to help us understand our race and cultural um, challenges in the United States. And I reflected as a, as a student in that classroom when he was teaching it, that it wasn't a surprise to me. It was, I, it was, mm. it's reprehensible and it's terrible, but as a former history teacher and as somebody who's taught history, I was familiar with the story that he was telling and I was able to kind of catch up with him and see where he was going. Um, the challenge that I saw from a lot of my peers that were in the room with me, and these were all adults that are colleagues of mine um, in Oakland, is that many of them had no idea that that history was there. And they were shocked by it and shocked by um, how it's showing up today. Like they were really, they were blown away. And it was the first time in a long time that I've appreciated, um, yeah, my history background. Like it becomes something that you just kind of know, right? Right. (laughs) But suddenly I was like, oh yeah, it was, it's still (laughs) playing out. It's still important. So um, when we come back from break, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about the work that you've done with teachers, um, including me. I was one of your students. So, so when we get back, we'll talk about that. Yeah. So we'll be back. This is the Awakening Educator, and we'll be back in about a minute. Thank you.
With all of life's stressors, it can be challenging to stay balanced and healthy. Hemp-derived cannabis oil or CBD supplements such as Plus CBD oil are becoming well recognized as a key supplement to optimize wellness. By working directly with our own internal system that maintains homeostasis, the endocannabinoid system, CBD, can help restore the body's natural rhythm when we need it the most. Learn more about Plus CBD oil and how to balance the system that balances you from www.pluscbdoil.com. That's www.pluscbdoil.com. Hi, welcome back to The Awakening Educator. We're here with Larry Cuban. Uh, welcome back. You can connect with us online. You can follow us on social media on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube as United Intentions and Higher Intention on Twitter. And you can connect with us directly at The Awakening Educator at The Awakening Educator on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Yep. UI Media Network offers a host of advertising services as well, even if your budget's limited. So if you want your business to grow, call 678-495-4345 now and learn more about our specials and for your own commercial. Great. And welcome back again to The Awakening Educator, Larry, and thank you for joining us. Uh, when we went on break, I was saying that you've taught a lot of teachers history, how to teach history over time, <laughs> including myself, 25 years ago. Um, and um, I'm just wondering, like, as you think, as you approach teaching teachers, um, what did you most emphasize in pre-service teachers? And what were the big ideas that you wanted to ensure that teachers embodied and, and why? Why were those important? All right, I, I began training teachers when I was a very young teacher and accepted uh, student teachers when I was teaching in Cleveland. I was in my early 20s and uh, 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 a local college would uh, ask me to be their uh, affiliate or coordinating or cooperating teacher. So I began then. And I learned an awful lot before I met you, Megan, and was teaching. <laughs> at Stanford about uh, uh, teaching um, history to people who are going to teach history to young people. Uh, when I was in Washington, D.C., as I mentioned, there were a number of returned Peace Corps volunteers who wanted to learn how to teach history. And uh, for over a four-year period, I taught a number of people how to teach history while I was teaching myself. I would teach two classes a day, they would teach two classes a day, and we would watch each other teach. So I brought a lot of experience to Stanford before I taught in the STEP program. And remember, uh, uh, Lee Swenson was a, uh, from Aragon High School. Lee and I teamed up for the 10 years that we taught that social studies course to you and your peers and to a generation of, of uh, history teachers. So in answer to your question, there are two things that I focus on. One is that you gotta know content. You gotta know the concepts, the principles, and of, uh, of if it's US history, if it's European history, you have to become very well versed in your field. There is no replacement for content. The second is that uh, historical content, content can be taught in many ways, uh, but uh, there are ways that are determined by history. So that for the sake of example, Lee and I, it was Lee's idea, not mine, was to use cartoons to train teachers to, uh, to use cartoons with their kids, political cartoons, from the 19th century, from the 20th century. Uh, the cartoons that I remember were the ones for, uh, on President Nixon with, uh, done by the cartoonist Herbert Block for the Washington Post. All of those things are, um, are a way of exploring history in a different way to get at what are the basic concepts that you are driving at. Now, for that to happen, the uh, the teacher has to know uh, the has to know about Watergate, 
has to know about Richard Nixon uh, in order to convey that to the students in many different ways. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> well, thinking about the content, and, and there is so much content, right? I mean, history, and, and as we go on, the history content gets bigger and longer. Um, knowing that the decision about what history gets told to who and whose voice is heard and, and what perspective is, seems to be really key, especially as we talk about uh, race and culture and, and systematic ways oppression has, has continued. What is it, how is it that you see those decisions being made around what, gets to, what uh, story gets told and how and whose lens? Yeah, uh, what, uh, what I've done over the years with uh, uh, teachers who want to uh, teach history is that they have to use multiple sources all the time. And it, uh, it could be print and non-print sources, but they cannot stick to one textbook. Even if the district requires you to use a textbook, you don't have to use it every day. You have to have other sources to get at the many voices that have to be looked at in order to interpret the past. Because that's what history is, it's interpretation. It's not a, a set of facts that everyone agrees on. It just isn't. So uh, you have to have multiple sources. The other thing about history that I neglected to mention when I was answering Megan's question was that, uh, that it's not only content. That's the first thing that comes to mind. And it's not only the skills of presenting that content. It's also developing a community in the classroom in a relationship with the teacher because the two go together if you want to get at learning because yeah some kids can repeat the facts for you and all that but it would be sterile just to repeat those facts what you need to do is to develop a give and take with students where they can trust you and are willing to take risks to come up with wrong answers in classrooms most, uh, it's very hard for kids to make mistakes publicly. That's the nature of the age graded school is that there are right and wrong answers. Well, not when it comes to history. Oh yeah, there are dates and names and certain facts, but history is interpretation. So you have to have uh, teach kids how to create an argument that supports a point of view and also develops evidence to support that. Kids have to take chances. They have to do that within the context of feeling that this teacher is someone who's pushing me, but also I feel comfortable enough to give my point of view. That notion of knowing content and building a community are crucial to any history teacher. Yeah, thanks for that, Larry. One of my sources, I don't know if you count this amongst your, your 25 books or not, and maybe I'm remembering it wrong, but I feel like one of my first history books had your name on it, of like ancient history. Ah. So you wrote history books as well, right? I did. I wrote a, a <laughs> series of U.S. history textbooks, yes. Yeah, so uh, when I learned how to teach history, they didn't have officially uh, official textbook adopted history mm -hmm. lessons. But as I dug through my first classroom, I uncovered this book that had Larry's name on it in ancient <laughs> history. And it was such a wonderful, as a new teacher, you're terrified and nervous and all that. So it was such a wonderful gift just to hold a book that had your name on it. Uh, when I was teaching great, for my first time. Series. I'm sorry, Megan, I ran over you. Oh, I, that's okay. That's, uh, how did you, I didn't hear the rest of your sentence. I was saying it was such a comfort to have you there. And I used your textbook as part of my, as part of my core group of, of instructional materials. And actually, I, I will say that that absolutely is a discipline that you and Lee instilled in me as a teacher is I use the textbook as a reference material along with other reference materials. And the way I went about teaching was to do a lot of research, go to the library, look at it from different points of view and present those to my students. So I, I think that's a really helpful framing that you're naming. One of the things that you, excuse me, they also just talked about though, was about building cult, uh, like a, a culture in your classroom yeah. and safety in your classroom. Yeah. And um, it, it's, what occurs to me is not only do we need to know our own history, uh, our history of like the country, but we also need to own, understand our own history and how we show up in the classroom with our students. 
Mm -hmm. And when I was at Stanford, it was the first time that I was introduced to the notion of a culture of power that exists within the United States and that I was a part of that culture of power. I didn't, it didn't occur to me um, until then that that was true. And it was a really uh, important and painful and sobering realization to take at such a, a important part of my development. So I'm just wondering about for teachers in general or perhaps history teachers, what part does knowing themselves and how they fit in or how they show up in front of their kids or how their kids might interpret them? Um, how do we support them around that? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, the history of an individual, knowing yourself and your own history, that's what I think is, is where you start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, to the degree that you know your, uh, uh, the generations before you in your own family, and you could write your own bio uh, if you could, that's very crucial to understanding where you stand in relation to other people and to know your own history. So mm -hmm. the history of the individual, and then the history of a community, the history of a nation, those are all entangled with one another. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that responds to your point, uh, but knowing, I've been in a bunch of classrooms this past uh, few months where uh, teachers, uh, at, uh, one school in Oakland and one school in Southern California, where teachers um, explicitly teach about the oppressive social and political structures. That's one way to do that. You know, you know, there are many ways to teach history, and they go into the history of that. Uh, then there are other. Uh, there, then there are other situations where individual kids will raise issues about where they stand. Uh, both boys and girls, where they stand in relation if they're uh, an immigrant and where they stand with their family and a different culture that they came to uh, the school that where they're now sitting and how people respond to them and how they feel either disempowered or empowered, depending on the school. All of that has to occur in a classroom where the kids will trust the teacher. And gaining kids' trust is not easy. It just, mm -hmm. particularly in high schools, more so, mm -hmm. a little easier in elementary if you know how to go around doing it. But in high schools where there's constant changing of teachers in classes, it's much harder. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I, I, again, back to that being the foundation. I think of a of a lot of the work that I do is around like how do you create cultures and environments where relationship is built and agree. There's a lot of research coming out now that actually the the quality of the relationship between the teacher and the students has a significant impact on how much content they actually absorb. And so even the same content and the same lessons provided by someone, there's a positive relationship is, is better absorbed by the student. So I'm glad you're really speaking to that and teaching teachers at that level. I'm, I'm curious about the, um, the use of cartoons as metaphors, to, because I think that that's so powerful. And I, my understanding is it's kind of a hallmark of your instruction in history. And I, I love the idea because it's the humor that comes up in cartoons throughout history does tell us so much. So how do you use the political humor and how does it show up in the classroom? Well, I learned most of that from Lee. Mm. Uh, and so uh, he showed me how to do that in classrooms. Uh, and uh, he was uh, very sophisticated in doing it. And what it does, it shows a, a particular point in time when, uh, and uh, I'm thinking of the cartoonist Bill Maudlin during World War II, where he was trying to show what it was like to be a GI in, uh, uh, with mud all over the uniform, uh, with uh, stubble on the GI's face, and Maudlin was terrific. He ended up dying in the war. As a cartoonist, he conveyed what it was like for American GIs to fight in a war, and that's not easy, and rather than go over what some teachers do is go over battle, over battle, over battle. You don't have to do that if you use cartoons. Uh, adroitly. You just don't have to do it that way. 
And I saw Lee do that uh, very well in his own classrooms over at Aragon High School. Uh, and that opened up a lot of avenues for teaching history because most people don't associate the analysis of cartoons and how and what you see in the cartoon, what is the satire, what is the cartoonist's purpose in this, uh, what is the caption? We would use cartoons. So we're gonna we're gonna go to break in okay. a second. We are on the. I'm so glad that we're having this rich conversation, and we'll be back sure. for our last segment. This is the Awakening Educator. Okay. Sure. Download the UI Media Smart App at uimediaapp.com to watch and listen to all your favorite shows anytime from anywhere in the world. Shows that enrich, entertain, educate, and feeds the conscious cells throughout your body. We bring you never heard before topics in health, inspiration, music, psychics, numerology, current affairs, controversies, and much, much more. So what are you waiting for? Visit www.uimediaapp.com and start raising your frequency now. Hi, welcome back to the UI Media Network and the Awakening Educator. Um, you can uh, tune in later today for Ride the Vibe with Michael Litton, as we said earlier, when he interviews violinist Brooke Alford. Uh, we're also on Binge Network TV. Visit us at www.bingenetworks.tv and look for UITV under channel 12783. Our new channel is featured on Apple TV, Google Play, Roku, Amazon Fire, and more. Welcome back. We're with Larry Cuban. And when we were going into break, we were talking about the use of cartoons for uh, teaching history. And what came up for me as you were talking was a conflict of um, maybe that challenge between policy and practice that mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier, which is um, I was always very comfortable not teaching every single history date and every single battle. Um, uh, I was I much was I was much more interested and concerned with helping kids to understand the bigger picture of what was going on and which pieces felt like the most important ones to have that be in place. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, I think my students love that because they didn't have to worry about memorizing as many dates. It wasn't as dry in that way. But on occasion, I would get feedback from a student or a parent about the fact that I didn't prepare them well for their state testing um, on history, and it was always such an interesting conflict for me. So. Um, I don't know how you, I mean, it's, it, I don't know how you guys navigated it then, or if it was an issue as you and Lee were talking or te te teaching us teachers to do that. But, um, it was just an interesting thought that came up for me of like, right. Um, it's that balance again, between mm -hmm. being able to make decisions in the classroom that feel most important and needed for your kids and preparing them for an assessment that's going to measure the, the kids like future trajectory, as well as the teachers. I mean, we don't, attach it to teacher pay, but that conversation that comes up. So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what you think about that. Sure. Uh, this is a basic dilemma facing all teachers. The dilemma is the tension between autonomy, mm -hmm. that you have the discretion to make choices about what you are going to teach, and obligation. Autonomy and obligation are conflicting values that creates a dilemma for you. And so the obligation is you want your kids to do well on the test and they have a history section. So how are you going to get that across when you know that you want to teach more conceptual stuff and you can't cover everything from, uh, from Columbus to uh, uh, the Vietnam War? Just can't. <laughs> or Afghanistan. So uh, this is the tension that... Uh, that goes with every uh, teacher that enters a classroom. It goes in, in every subject, in English, in obviously in history. Uh, it goes on in science, biology. You have to choose. That's the autonomy you have. What you're really going to focus on. At the same time, you have to keep one eye pitched toward, uh, is this going to be on the test? And that that dilemma got much more acute 
with no child left behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, there were no history tests per se under no child left behind, but some districts and uh, some states still had uh, social studies tests. And uh, uh, the National Assessment for Educational Progress, NAEP, had civics tests uh, done periodically. So the autonomy versus obligation is a constant tension that teachers face, not only in history, but across all subjects. And if it is being tested, uh, when people would ask me, what shall I do? I'd say, take a week off toward the end before the test and go over the stuff that you think will be on the test. But yeah. then the rest of the year, uh, uh, you exercise your autonomy. I appreciate you saying that. And I'm sure Susan has a question, but it's, it's such a great point around just, you made me remember I had a colleague uh, many years ago who would go in when the kids were taking their state test and count the number of questions we were teaching world history per country. And then she would go to our textbook and decide, do complicated math, more complicated than I could figure on how much time then, like if, you know, we were studying about Japan and there were five questions on Japan versus um, questions about uh, the World War One in Europe, um, how much time she would then spend on each of those subjects in the classroom. That's and it, really teaching to the test. That's really right. teaching to the test. And it broke my heart because then you, you lose the through line in the story, right? And, right. And, and it's also very Eurocentric, which is a problem for me. But you lose some of those other pieces of why history is magical and important. Right. And you can only get to the dates at something like that. So just you reminded me about that and, and how powerless I felt at that point to change this, uh, my colleague. I tried to talk her out of it, but that was like, <laughs> So that point that Megan just sort of touched on a little bit of, of the teacher's um, dilemma that you mentioned between the autonomy versus the state test, how do you help? Obligation. Obligation. Yeah, obligation. Obligation. Right. And how do you help the teachers with their own anxieties around um, showing up in the classroom, managing the relationship, managing the content, learning how to be a teacher, sure. learning all of that art that goes with it? How do you help them with that? Well, uh, Megan knows that uh, in that course, uh, Lee and I worked on something called dilemmas. Mm. Uh, autonomy versus obligation is an inherent dilemma to teaching. There are plenty of other dilemmas too. But what uh, the way uh, that I answer your question, Susan, is that you have to have the person who's going to be the teacher understand what a dilemma is and that not to feel guilt over it. It's not their fault that they're stuck because they're teaching a course in a public school and they are getting paid to do it, but there are things over which they have no control, but they have to make decisions, what I call compromises. They have to be, they have to have some autonomy, but they also have to have a sense of obligation to the kids and to their future and you make compromises, you manage the dilemma. Uh, and so I, so Lee and I, and I've done that repeatedly with all kinds of folks, teach about dilemmas and the conflict of values that go on all the time within each of us, whether we are teachers, whether we are uh, fathers, husbands, wives, mothers, all of these dilemmas are part of the human condition. And the more you learn about these things, the less guilty you feel. And then you figure out, well, what's a compromise that I can best make that'll satisfy some of these conflicting values? So that's what I, that's what I did with, what Lee and I did with Megan and her colleagues. And I continue to do today with my daughters and friends. It's, it's interesting because I think um, when we think about the awakening educator and our, our what we want to accomplish on this show, that's so connected to our overall goal is to be able to untangle some of these dilemmas and really think through how can we creatively understand what's happening in our education system and start to think like how do we support teachers and leaders and creative folks to make the best decisions to create the best education that we can yeah. for our kids. Yeah, I was, I was appreciating that too, Larry. And um, I was thinking about my book a little bit and, 
you know, one of the key elements of the book is the self-awareness and, and being aware that you ha have to have some self-awareness about what's going on. And I was appreciating, again, the grounding of, of what you and Lee gave to me as a young teacher. I was 21 when I landed on your doorstep and um, was teaching kids at you know, 22 years old. And uh, I've always, and you know, I'm sassy, so that might be part of it, but like I always... <laughs> Like I was aware and it was normalized that these uh, that these conflicts were going to come up and just the brilliance of, of, of teaching pre-service teachers that you're going to have dilemmas and you're going to have to make choices. And that's a normal, regular part about being a teacher, I think often actually gets lost yes. on teachers and then on principals mm -hmm. and then on superintendents. Mm -hmm. Like it just keeps going up the line. And so people get kind of frozen and they're yeah. so afraid to do something wrong that they kind of get like, it becomes a real tension point. So I just really appreciate and want to honor the the grounding you gave everybody in that from the beginning. Um, and it's one of those things that's so normalized for me that maybe I never even realized yeah. where it came from. So I'm appreciating that today. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I think the one of the first things you brought up was the disproportionality and the history of disproportionality. And that is another topic that I'm hoping that we can thread through all of our shows and that we can educate her. You mentioned your book, but you didn't mention the name of your book. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yeah, so the name of my book is An Educator's Guide for Using Your Three Eyes. And it talks about how we need to, a lot, a lot of what we talked about today in our conversation, Larry, but how we need to learn to see ourselves also from different points of view and, and bring that self-awareness into the classroom so that we can address, you know, race and cultural competence, uh, create safety in the classroom with our kids, have the internal strength and uh, confidence to make those hard decisions to live within the dilemmas and and to move through them without getting so stuck. So that's the notion of the book. Um, and it's hard to believe, but we are coming to the end of our show. We only have another minute or two. And so we want to make sure that we thank Larry and thank all of our guests and also talk about what we have coming up in the next few shows yeah so um larry this has been an amazing conversation i think his not only about history but also about teaching teachers which is is such an important piece of our education system and i think that that often it, it feels foreign to what's happening in this classroom and so we're so grateful that you brought that lens well, thank you thank you very much yeah, yeah i think it's often we 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 people think that teaching is something that you can learn over a summer or really quickly. <laughs> and, um, but there's a lot of, of art that is built into it mm -hmm. and a lot of intentionality, especially if you go through a traditional program. And so I just want to honor that and, and thank you for the, the thousands of teachers that you've touched over your lifetime. Um, all for much, much, much better. And so grateful for you to come on the show today, Larry. Um, and grateful for your continued presence in my life all these 25 years. It's uh, been wonderful. And, and you in my life too, Megan. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Larry. Um, bye. Bye, 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 Larry. I want to thank my son, uh, always, and uh, the, the crew over at United Intentions, uh, Wahid and Davey, today for helping us with the Thanks, show. Thanks, Wahid and Davey. You're the best. <laughs> Uh, we also, I would like to thank my children, Gus and Izzy, and my amazing husband, Chris, for supporting this and all of the crazy ventures. Um, and of course, No Small Children, whose music is featured both at the beginning and the end of our show. Uh, you can find a link to No Small Children music on the Awakening Educator Facebook page. Yeah. And just want to thank everybody for joining us today and to, to catch us later. Thanks again. Class is dismissed. Wasn't that fun? Susan and Megan are always happy to greet you on the next episode of The Awakening Educator every other Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Watch all our shows anytime from anywhere in the world at uimediaapp.com. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Spreaker at United Intentions to be up to date with the show. Have any questions you'd like to ask? Maybe you have knowledge you'd like to share. Email us at contact at unitedintentions.org and we will read your comments live on air. 
Education is the foundation for a brighter future. Open your eyes to the awakening educator only on the UI Media Network. The United Intentions Foundation and its associates take no responsibility for the opinions and